So, hi, I'm Nancy, and um, I am a volunteer, a uh, long time volunteer staffer for the organization for Transformative Arts, uh, where I mostly write software for the archive of our own, also known as AO3, um, kind of our biggest project, and um, just give you a little you know, introduction to um, what are Transformative Arts. What, why we need a whole nonprofit about them, and what are we doing with our archive. Um, so, a little bit, you know, transformative works can be any sort of creative works that sort of reinterpret or transform, remix another existing work. So, you can have transformative video, for example, play a little bit of that. A YouTube artist. Oh, shows, YouTube videos, any of those things. Um, and there's a, a quote that I really like from an article in Time Magazine. Um, you don't read all of them, but fan fiction is what literature might look like or reinvented from scratch after a nuclear apocalypse. They're a band of brilliant pop culture junkies trapped in a field bunker. Um, basically like, you know, picking up pop culture and remaking it the way you want it to be, telling new stories, telling existing stories from new perspective, any of those things. And um, it's important to note that fan fiction is not necessarily held in the highest regard, I think, in terms of culture in general. But it's it's a very old idea, um, sort of older than the existing kind of copyright structure that we have today. So I found this on Tumblr a while back, and I really loved it. Uh, so this is Virgil's fanfiction.net profile. Um, so, Basically, the Aeneid, which is a you know, work in Latin, um, is basically telling the Iliad from the perspective of, you know, a different character <laughs> for, you know, a Roman audience instead of a Greek audience. So it's, you know, picking up the existing story and reframing it and retelling it to add things and a big fan of Homer. So, um, so general summary, transformative works, fan fiction, and art, remix, mashup, and AMVs, they have films, Vinci, Ray Press, Cosplay, more like everything under the sun that you can imagine. Uh, we're always finding people doing new things that you know I wouldn't even have expected. Um, just like transforming everything they come into contact with in creative ways with any materials on hand. Uh, Someone listens to Minecraft. Videos. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I should put that on there. Um, she can um, And 
talking about um, we're talking about transformative works. We're talking about legal fair uses um, of you know under copyright law. You know, especially in the U.S., I can't speak for you know legal situation in the world, but. You know, these are generally cases of people using, you know, part of a material largely for non-commercial uses. Um, it's not piracy or plagiarism. Um, one of our board members was um, testifying for Congress, and they were having some difficulty with but uh, that was what they were supposed to be issuing rulings on. But, uh, so, um, and just to back up a little, so transformative works. A little bit about me and how I got involved with this. Um, so back in the day, um, in the, the olden days of the 1990s, um, very significant moment in my life, uh, my oldest brother moved back home after college. He got a job near my parents' house. And he brought a wonderful thing with him, which was disposable income. My parents were a little older. You know, my dad was retired. Um, so we had at home at the time, this is the 90s, had a rotary telephone. We had an 8-track player, which they didn't listen to because that was too new angle. I think we still had a black and white TV. So, um, so my brother moved back home, had some money, so we got cable TV, and we got the internet. <laughs> and this was a very exciting thing, and I heard about the internet. Like, you can use it to talk to people all over the world, you can look stuff up. So one day, I said, does it work or something? So I'm like, okay, this is my moment, I can get online. Uh, and then it's like, well, I don't actually know anybody to talk to. Um, but, you know, I can look stuff up, so what am I interested in? And what I was watching on TV at the time was The X-Files. So I went and looked up The X-Files, and it turned out there were a lot of people online who were also interested in The X-Files. Um, so that was, turned out to be a good place to start. And, uh, so, you know, there were forums and boards and news groups and everything, people talking about the TV show. And, you know, I was clicking around on AOL, and they had their newsreaders, so I had that alt.tv.xfiles group where people would talk about the show. And then there's another group called alt.tv.xfiles.creative. And I was like, I wonder what that is. Uh, so I wander over, and I'm a teenager, and I'm brand new to the internet. I'm like clicking around, and there's this whole list of stuff. And They've got titles and stuff and a bunch of acronyms that I didn't understand. Um, so I just opened one up at random, and it turned out to be like the middle part of a very explicit flesh fiction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of people would you know find that and they're like, I found my people, like this is great. But I was a little bit of a, a late bloomer, so I was a little bit like, this might be too much for me. Um, so I kind of backed out of that, and uh, so I moved on and. Um, you know, eventually sort of found my way back, like the path that was good for me at the time. Um, but was was really impressed by what people were doing so that like people were writing all of these stories and like writing entire novels and posting them online for free. And you know, often in the case of the X Files, making a lot more sense of the story than the actual TV show did. Uh, so, you know, it was something that I paid attention to and uh fast forward a bit. About 10 years later, so I went to college, I majored in English, ended up working at a law firm. And, uh, but I wasn't super happy about the law, so I was really interested in learning how to code um, after school. So I started working on that and bought you know, introduction to Java, and sitting at home and trying to figure that out from a book. And this is, you know, about 2006, 2007, so right before, you know, Stack Overflow and GitHub and a lot of, you know, better places that we have today to learn things and, you know, I'd try and figure things out and get confused and I'd be like, well, I have to go on an IRC channel to ask people for help. It's really intimidating. I don't really want to do that. Um, but something else happened, which was significant, which is, so that's 2007, a uh, big Web 2.0 times from a monetize all the content and so there were a couple of guys who discovered that fandom existed, this sort of creative fandom, people generating all this content. Um, and they're like, oh, this is awesome. Like, we'll come in and we'll build a site and everybody can post it there. And so they were sort of aggressively marketing that to fans and then sending out press releases to media companies that are like, this is going to be great. We're going to corral all these people for you and we're going to, you know, control them and then you 
sell them things, monetize the stuff that they're doing, and the community was not very far of this idea. Um, so it started to be a bit of a grassroots movement to sort of build our own space. Um, so Dan S. Lab wrote this big post, we need an archive of our own. It's our history, our community, uh, to be able to make the roles for ourselves. Um, and as one of our other founders put it, we need to own the goddamn server. So <laughs> fans had been posting on a whole variety of sites, you know, from Usenet and then Yahoo groups, uh, e-groups, forums, you know, bulletin boards, live journal, and would often sort of, you know, have conflicts with site owners about, you know, what they thought was appropriate, and, you know, just different priorities. Uh, posting video on YouTube was a great example. A lot of the videos that people were making were fair use, but YouTube didn't necessarily care that they were legal. Um, if a media company said, take this down, they would take it down. Um, and, you know, it's still an issue today that, you know, people have to kind of appeal that. Um, so it was a very important thing to sort of own the space that you're working in, to sort of own the land that you're farming. Um, you know, so that's a lot of power to own the servers and to write the code. And traditionally, like a lot of female communities online don't have that because they're underrepresented in the tech space. So they're working, you know, and contributing a lot of their own work to spaces that are run, you know, by capitalist companies, big companies that don't necessarily share their values. So it's a big moment. So we started to build um, an archive. Archive on the room. And uh, it's written in Ruby on Rails. And uh, so that was, we started the organization in 2007. And the archive really took off in 2008. Um, sort of, you know, open, I think, limited release um, into that year and sort of more widely in 2009. And today it's a pretty active site, growing community, a million works, millions of bookmarks. Lots of users. We do have um, an invite-only policy, um, which sort of caps user growth a bit. Um, but we do get a lot of visitors, a lot of pages. The first site, um, and it's all volunteer run, so nobody works on it. So we get a lot of traffic. So I'm learning a lot. Um, and from my perspective, this was where I learned how to write code, and I, I volunteered for the project, and I was like. You know, I'd taken a little bit of C++, read a little Java, a little bit of PHP, that kind of stuff. And I was like, well, I'm going to volunteer. They're not going to want me, because it's a pretty tech-savvy community, and they're going to have a lot of people who actually know what they're doing. Um, but it turned out um, that when you ask people to volunteer for things, especially like really time-intensive things, uh, they fall off pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, this is a really cool project, and I support you, but I don't actually have an extra you know, 20, 30 hours in my week to like devote to doing unpaid work. Um, so I just started volunteering for things, sort of locked myself in a room and like learned to code. And you know, the first project I worked on was our authentication system. <laughs> they were like, can you build an authentication system? And I was like, sure, I can do that. I will go look that up on Google. Uh, I have our commenting system and bookmarks and everything. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the, the worst code that I wrote has since been replaced over there because of the authentication system. That was so uh, Great way to go. But um, yeah, so, so that was kind of a, a crucible, a learning curve, and, you know, we've got a lot of people involved. I would say, you know, we do have some guys who work on the project, but it's mostly women, uh, probably like 90%. Um, we've been going for almost seven years now, with 52 contributors, um, lots of lines of code, I think that's what we're exactly. Um, but yeah, so that's a, a big project, and, um, yeah, speaking of imposter syndrome, if you have to, you know, I, I do work in software now, but making that jump from like, well, I've, I've been writing a lot, I've been building this stuff that's, you know, out in production and millions of people are using it, and yeah, I, I learned how to code from online fandom, but you should totally give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was a little tricky. But uh, so in terms of, you know, sort of fan communities and open source culture, uh, open source software. Um, I've you know been working with them over the last 
six years. Um, so notice, you know, things that are similar in the two communities and the two worlds and things that are slightly different and, you know, ways that they sort of could possibly learn from each other or establish that. So three main areas I wanted to talk about, sort of the mechanics of how we do our work, sort of the politics of why we do this, and sort of the communities that we work in. Um, and a little bit of a detour through theory. So I was an English major, and one of the big things that I was really interested in there was um, the idea of intertextuality and the way that sort of you know books and literature um, sort of connect to one another, and the way you know that impacts people who are writing and people who are reading, uh, ways that things are connected to one another. Um, so it was a quote I ran about, I ran into again recently. Um, Frontiers of the book, they're never clear cut. Beyond the title, the first line, and the last full stop, then its internal configuration and its autonomous form is caught up in a system of references to other books, other texts, other sentences. There's a node within a network. I think that's a really cool way to look at sort of all of you know art and literature and creative works and also technical works. Um, that the way, you know, everything that we create is sort of a part of a larger network. And, you know, if you look at that very literally, here's a GitHub network. Um, you know, so this is a Simpsons CSS library. Uh, I was looking for a small one. Uh, but yeah, so, so somebody posts that on GitHub and other people fork it. And so that's a very explicit connection of, you know, these things, you know, sort of pull directly from one another and you know maybe I take your Simpsons CSS library and make them all green instead of yellow because that's what I want to do. Um, very similar kind of to, to fan culture, like taking the thing and sort of making some changes. Like I will make your characters into women instead of men or you know I will make this character gay instead of straight or black instead of white or you know, I will change the ending. I've read Game of Thrones and I didn't like it because you killed off that Ned Stark guy and I really liked him. So I'm going to write my own version where he lives. Um, so that kind of thing. So the very explicit sort of connections. And on the larger side of things, if you think about, you know, there's this really cool page on Wikipedia, the generational list of programming languages, like the family tree of all programming languages and the ways that they sort of inherit from one another. Um, and you think about like all of the work in software that you know people do inherit from one another and they're influenced by one another. And I think it's really cool to look at the ways that that happens over the years and to maybe look at what we can learn. Um, so I think you know in sort of the literature world, there's a lot. You know, there's literary theory and these ideas of influence, but there's also a, a high value placed on originality. Um, so not necessarily a huge respect for more derivative works, but I sort of view it more as a continuum of influence, where it's not you have your original over here and you have your derivatives over here, and they're they're totally different from one another, but where everything is sort of influenced by what came before and what else is going on. And some of it is more explicitly influenced and some of it is a little more loosely influenced. But, you know, if you are you know, writing Ruby, I write Ruby, it uh, might be good to know what people have been doing before. You're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, you can learn some things. So, uh, one of the sort of things that comes up in fandom is the idea of fandom, right? Where you have your official canon of what happened in the book, what happened in the movie. And then people come up with their own ideas. Um, it's a big one in like Harry Potter fandom where you had like the older characters, like Harry's parents. Um, and people would write stories about them going to Hogwarts and they would make up, you know, because they have, I think in the books, like two scenes where you see the characters as young people. So you make up these whole histories and personalities and everything for them and then in a sort of closed community where everybody is sort of paying attention to what everybody else is doing, that sort of spreads out and you, you get these things and people almost forget what happened in the book and what people made up. And uh, reminds me a little bit of, okay, but, but sort of like cargo pulping software where 
you know, you have a closed community and ideas sort of pick up and, you know, like, you know, Jill started doing this this way and lots of other people see the code and they start doing it that way and sort of the ideas sort of spread kind of infectiously throughout the community because we're all looking at what each other is doing. Um, and well, nice. What is, how does that mean? How does cargo culting? I mean, I, I know what cargo cults are, like in the islands. Too. Oh, what does that mean in time? How, how does that mean? Yeah, what does it mean in this context? It means sort of like looking at somebody's code and you're using a certain syntax, and I start using it even though I don't entirely know what it means or why it's good. Um, because so I respect so you. So it's not internal. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that doesn't make any sense to me, but I'll just accept that it's internal. Code. Yeah, if you have a better. I mean, just if you picture the coders who came before you as the United States, uh, okay. who had this, left this cargo behind that you don't understand. And you're just like, whoa, it's magic. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Stretch, but okay. <laughs> so they're, they're not entirely similar concepts. But no, no, it's just yeah. I don't know the term in this context. So. Um, and another thing is so the idea of, um, you know, in art and fan fiction. Uh, design patterns, tropes, archetypes, motifs. Um, you maybe borrow from somebody, you know, kind of explicitly, with or without knowing it, or you know, you might be doing it on purpose. Um, so design patterns, what an idea of like what people have done before, you know, that tends to be effective. And you see that a lot in literature, like you know, kinds of stories that work, and so people tell them over and over again. Um, and I think those are important to recognize so that you know when they are useful, you know when you are doing them, uh, and you know how other people are likely to interpret that. Um, and so just in general, this idea of, you know, software and culture sort of having these sort of circles of influence, and I think, you know, one of the things that's just important is to own your influences, to know what you're being influenced by, to know, you know, the history of your community. Uh, those are important things. Um, yeah, so next one is okay. So what what are we why are we doing these things? Why are we doing lots of work for free? Uh, to be getting paid for it. Um, and a few big reasons. Uh, things that your community is looking for, things that you as an individual want, uh, gaps in the marketplace that aren't being filled, um, just to explore creativity um, and sort of play around, you know, as a software developer or as an artist or both. Um, those can be big things. And, uh, you know, one of the big spaces there with sort of fan culture is that, you know, commercial works don't always reflect the diversity of their audience. So that sort of opens up a space for people to sort of write themselves in the stories. Um, so uh, I know a couple of people who made a fan film. I don't know if anybody has seen the show Supernatural. Um, but it's about two brothers who drive around the country fighting monsters. And a big critique of it is they sort of kill off all the women on the show in kind of violent fashion. <laughs> so they wrote this, basically, they made their own episode and wrote a script and cast people. Um, and in it, um, the brothers have been turned into women, I believe, by a spell. Um, and so they're, they're played by actresses. And so this is sort of, you know, a response to that show and, and the sort of, you know, masculinity in it. And like, well, now we're going to take your characters and we're going to make them into women and we're going to tell our own story about this. Um, and it can also be a big thing, um, like race sending, writing characters who are in a show white, that's, you know, black or Asian, uh, was just kind of a response to the Avatar of the Last Airbender movie, where they took characters who were Asian and cast white people. Um, a lot of people fight for great reasons. Um, and yeah, and I think it's it's just very important and very cool to have kind of spaces for free expression, uh, to try things out outside of your job. Um, that's a big thing, you know, a, a lot of people with software, you know, just to do something different from what you're doing every day, um, to have a chance to try out, you know, new languages, new libraries. Um, those are all really important. Um, oh, and here's another. So this is a big thing. Uh, Canon, you're waiting for a large amount of sales. You'd like to apply to 
This is like a patch to apply to your broken TV show. Maybe you will like it again. Um, and another thing on the topic of politics, um, so one of the big things with AO3 was the idea of posting it ourselves um, versus sort of living on you know commercial posts. And I, you know, I was thinking about that in terms of like open source, which is this you know, big open source community. A lot of it lives on GitHub, which is a commercial enterprise. You know, other places, Google Code, Bitbucket, SourceForge. You know, so there's a lot of like open work being posted on sort of closed communities. Um, and it is, you know, a lot of times that happens because they have the money to put into making them work really well. So, you know, there's there's benefits to that, to that. There's can also be costs when the values of your community don't necessarily match with the values of the company that you know your open source project is relying on. So that's a thing. And I uh, just wanted to say in building uh, the OTW and AR3, here's just like off the top of my head some of the open source projects that we use. Uh, that's not even a comprehensive list. Okay. But you know, it's pretty important to say uh, because free software exists, an independent or not for profit project can just start up and be like, we're going to build our site, we're going to build these web apps. Uh, and we don't have any money. <laughs> We're going to do it anyway because all of these tools exist. And I feel like I don't necessarily see as many arguments nowadays because open source software has been so successful of like why it should exist and why it's important. But I think it is still important that these things exist and they can sort of enable work in spaces you know where you can marginalize people or people starting out you know without capital. Uh, I mean, you know, to be able to have access to those tools. Um, you know, you know try to imagine the world where you had to buy the licenses from Microsoft for all of those things. Like, there'd be a big investment in fundraising just to get off the ground. Um, and then one comment on that, there are pros and cons to that. Uh, you have software, you have art, all this stuff online. It's free, it's great. Um, you do also have a lot of people doing a lot of unpaid labor, um, you know, and so that has its own drawbacks, uh, especially, you know, like a lot of the fan communities are women and they're doing a lot of sort of labor that they're not being compensated for in this sort of gift economy. And, you know, that's great up to the point where you're like, well, well I'm doing all this work and other people are getting paid for it and I'm not. Um, you know, so that can be something definitely to consider. Um, I know that that comes up a lot with software, and should you require people if you're interviewing for jobs that have done open source, and you know, kind of the politics and the economics of that. Um, and then additionally, barriers to entry and freedom to participate. So open source and open culture communities online and. You know, they are free from some of the more traditional types of gatekeeping. You don't need to go through a publisher to publish something. You don't need to have approval from, you know, the authority on high. Uh, you don't need to have a degree to start writing code. You just sit down with a computer. Um, so there are a lot of, you know, pluses to the kind of different cultures that we have. Uh, there are other downsides. I don't know that we necessarily have a utopia where everyone can participate in the fullest. Um, so like they're talking about the Project Ascend and the uh, OPW, um, so work on sort of bringing more people in who are still facing some of those barriers. And you know, I know in fandom there's often a lot of discussions about you have communities that you know are often still white or you know have their own sort of biases and tensions uh, that people still need to work on. It's not sort of for all uh, just to say, we're open, come join us. Or, or even just to say, we're open, you should know to come join us because we're open. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then the next thing is kind of the way the communities work, the structures that we have, and the motivations for people. Um, so in sort of the and we met side of things, a lot of the work is done kind of for feedback that you get. 
So the idea of the gift economy, one of the gifts that you can give back is to say, oh, I really, you know, I read this and I really loved it, I watched it, you know, and, and to sort of give that sort of positive feedback. So that's a big thing. On the other hand, um, fans are very uh, fraught about critique. Because a lot of people are doing it for fun. They don't want to hear, well, your grammar is bad, and, you know, if you would, you know, edited a few thousand words off the end, it would have been better. Um, so I think, you know, on the flip side, where I see kind of only source projects, a lot of them are, are a bit better about, you know, people have to take critique. You want the project to work. You want things to have these standards. So you have to learn to kind of separate yourself a bit from the code that you've written and not to be super defensive when somebody points out that there's a bug in it. I mean, uh, you know, that's easier said than done sometimes, but uh, in general, it is kind of a value that people have. Um, and I would say on the flip side there, there's not always the same value placed on giving people positive feedback. So you get, you know, you have a bug there, but not like, you know, sometimes you'll see, oh, you fixed that bug, it was really annoying me, thank you. But, you know, it's just like smaller work. A lot of that can just go by the wayside. Um, so I think, you know, uh, a big problem can be expectation mismatches. Uh, people can, you know, be good on both sides. Not necessarily that everybody who, you know, draws a picture of an elf, you know, needs to have critique on it like they want to be, you know, a professional artist. But, you know, uh, it's good to remember to give people the positive feedback. Uh, and. Another big thing in both communities, celebrity and entitlement. Uh, so in fandom, the idea is you have people who are known as big name fans or BFs. Uh, and there's sort of a there's there's sort of two sort of separate downsides to that. On the one hand, you know, you have people, you know, in any any sort of community who are sort of looking for status and they're kind of seeking that out, building themselves up. They're writing, you know, quick baby blog posts and they're sending them off to Apple News to get a lot of attention. Um, and sort of similar, similar dynamics in fan communities. You can sort of speak that out. Um, the flip side of that is that, you know, say you're you're just somebody who can, contributes to the community, you, you know, write good stuff, people like you, you help new people, um, so everybody starts to know who you are, so you get a certain following. And there can be a lot of downside to that. Um, to, you know, you would think if you were giving things away for free on the internet, that people would be grateful for that. And they wouldn't be like, give me more, give me more. Um, that is not actually how it works out in, in practice. Uh, a lot of people, if you post something, they're like, where's the rest of it? You know, um, you know you, you're working on a project, you know, an open source project. Like, why have you not urged my stuff in yet? Know, why haven't you fixed this yet? Um, so there's a lot of kind of entitlement out there to work that you're not actually paying people to do. Um, and you know there can be a real thing where like you start to think that you know people who are very well respected in a community and very widely heard are not real people, so they don't deserve your consideration in the same way uh, that everybody else does. Uh, well, you're you know a big success, so. Uh, you know, go online and write a post about how overrated you are and how much you suck, that kind of thing. And, you know, I'm going to send you like harassing messages on Twitter because I'm not really thinking of you as a person. So I think those are issues. I don't know that there's any magical solution on either level, but things to kind of be aware of humans kind of suck sometimes. But, uh, yeah. There's an idea kind of in fandom of a feral fandom, and I feel like I'm trying to find a new word for that. I don't know if they've done it because people get upset when you call them feral. That's <laughs> um, the idea. Um, so you have people who come in and they sort of form a new community without a lot of people who have been in the community before. So say you have like a Harry Potter fandom shoot up, and there's a lot of kids in it, there's a lot of new people. Um, 
and they don't necessarily know the way things have been done before. Uh, they don't have a lot of connections to kind of the wider world. So they sort of make their own rules and they make their own systems. And a lot of times they resemble the rules and systems that other people have had in the past. Uh, and they, you know, you know, bring a lot of great energy, but they end up reinventing some wheels. Um, and I think the same can be true. So I work with Ruby, and I noticed that there are a lot of people in kind of Ruby and Rails who are sort of came into it without necessarily a lot of history. Uh, and there are other sort of tech communities where that's kind of similar. And you have the same thing where you're sort of not aware of a lot of what's gone on before, and you end up sort of reinventing a lot of wheels and sort of figuring things out. You know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't build these giant monolithic applications. Maybe somebody's thought of that in the past. Like, good thing. Um, so we used to like, you know, you talk to those communities and figure out if you're in one. Um, there may be people who are worth talking to who have you know, kind of a wider perspective to investigate you know, the history of what you're doing. Um, and then community, um, a big part, you know, a big concern in both places is sort of bringing people, how do you bring people in, how do you keep people around, how do you give people good feedback. Um, so, kind of the social motivation to sort of keep going. And um, I think in you know, any sort of online community, especially like that social capital and offline communities as well, uh, is a very big deal. Um, you know, to, to sort of have people doing that work and they're not getting paid, but you know, it improves their standing in this community and they, they get more positive feedback that way. Um, and so, it, you know, one of the big things so working on AO3 is, so we are, you know, doing this kind of software project, and it doesn't necessarily um, feedback in the kind of you know positive professional ways that other projects might. Because you know I've I've actually had people open up the site you know at job interviews and I'm like this is what I've been working on. Uh, but you know it's it's a fan site. There's a lot of interesting user content on there. Um, so you know people may or may not want to actually explain that to their bosses. Um, so, you know, a big thing is, like, I noticed a lot of the people who do stick around have formed more, you know, like, social relationships with other people that they're volunteering with, and chat is a big thing, and keeping people engaged with one another really helps them to stick around, and I think that can be true in sort of both of those communities. And I think kind of one of the really big things, uh, if, if there's nothing else that people take away, I think, you know, often over, easy to overlook kind of the value of enthusiasm as kind of the currency that we work with. I'm not getting paid, you know, if you're doing open source work, it may or, you know, you might be getting paid for it. Uh, or it might have positive, you know, effects on your career path, you're able to put things on your resume, you're able to show people the work that you've done, which you might not be able to do if it's all kind of closed source of work. Um, but ultimately, like, you know, communities exist because people are excited about working on things, uh, fandom especially, and, you know, I would say, you're working on an open source project in fandom, enthusiasm is very important, um, not be overlooked. Uh, so, really kind of a critical thing to find ways to kind of nurture that and to you know, think about everything that you do as like how does this affect people's enthusiasm for their work, for what they're doing, and um, I think a big tension kind of in, I've seen in both of those communities is when people leave, because uh, you think of the sort of thing of like a language or a like, framework community or, or even a big open source project as being like a fandom. So it has its community and its figureheads and, you know, those people contribute a lot of value back. So it can be a lot of anxiety when somebody starts like, moving on and they're like, oh, you know, maybe I don't want to do this thing and say, oh, closure looks really cool. So that's fun. Um, and, you know, just ways to, you know, keep people around, like sometimes you have to accept that their enthusiasm is gone and they are moving on to something that they find more rewarding. So, um, but I do think, you know, thinking about people's happiness, 
think about, you know, not just ways that you can get work from them, but ways that you can sort of foster the enthusiasm that they have. Um, this is not somebody I know, this is somebody pretty of Calvin's picture, but I really love her shirt. I'm a fan girl. We don't do power. Uh, it's a big thing. Um, to have enthusiasm for what you're doing, and it creates, you know, incredible results that you don't necessarily get from people who are just sort of cranking out work at their jobs. Uh, and so, yeah, um, do they have questions? You're wearing a copyright shirt. <laughs> yes, question copyright. Well, um, I, I, I have a lot of questions, but you cover a heck of a lot of different topics. Um, so, I think that the biggest question that's come to my mind is somebody who is actually not a coding background, a chemical cultural background, and actually interested in these topics is the awareness of, I mean, like, this is nice, you get a talk and people are in open source can think about cultural issues. Um, but yeah, like, talking about Git, GitHub and stuff, and there seems to be a, I don't know, so a lot of people in, in culture, people talk about free culture or open culture. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they, in your, I guess I'll make it specific, but for your experience in the community that you work with, uh, how much do people think about or care about issues of Sort of the power structures of privacy for the things that they're doing, or the you know the systems that they're using. Like they've got oh, to consult with like this thing. Yeah. Like, I mean, they talk about things on Twitter, and everybody's on Facebook doing stuff. Or like, or that's an issue. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know a lot of people who are very leery of Facebook, and very leery of giving out their information, their pictures, and you know, a lot of you know, fandom has changed enormously in the last twenty years. For me, kind of a subculture that was kind of weird to being like. Oh, the Fifty Shades of Grey is on the bestseller list, and like now some Tumblr is posting, you know, Sherlock gifts, and like that's kind of what fandom is now. Um, but there used to be a lot of anxiety about like people knowing you were doing weird things on the internet. And, like, so it's not, there's not as much anxiety, like. I mean, is there a push of like, a, do people do a lot of stuff on Facebook, or somebody who says like, I don't do Facebook is then excluded from like a certain part of the community? No, the community doesn't operate. They, they say like, okay. So, I mean, it does tend to look, um, and I forgot to mention very much, because I wanted to mention it, about so, like posting your own stuff, which, you know, that was a big thing. Like, you know, live journal, like, the live journal ownership is being passed around, like, some people, you know, like, Russian owners now don't even care about the English speaking users of us. They really don't care so about your values. You besides owning the servers, are, the, are people that you work with in, in the free culture community conscious of the need to be connected to? An open source world and on the tech side, like they think about those issues or talk about them. Yeah, I mean, I would say both both DreamWorks and OTW are kind of the big kind of axes where where you have a lot of people sort of going in and, and sort of being aware of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of scary for me to sort of contribute to other projects because we had this like little walled garden and have all these female contributors and this very nice and safe to like write stuff. And it's like the wider world of open source, like it is important to get involved, but it's still intimidating. But yeah, I mean, there is a lot of awareness of what's going on, and a lot of people paying attention to privacy issues, I would say, on average. Uh, I was about uh, critiquing people's works, uh, contributions. I'm like, do it in such a way that it doesn't uh, dampen their enthusiasm? Yeah. Um, I don't know like, what two strategies for that are. Or, or, man, I was thinking, if possible, you could say, well, uh, how about if it was like do a remix or like a fork or something of their work and to show them that, like, like, not everyone has like the technical skills or capability to do so. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of a big thing. Like, we were sitting around in our chat one time and it was like ways that what we're doing is sort of like forking code. And it's like, what if we made it literally like forking, and you can just push a button and like fork someone's stuff, and the community would hate that if you did that literally. <laughs> really? um, they, they would hate that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, even they though like, like rewrote there's a lot parts of, of your story. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. There are people who have got like gotten very famous from writing fan fiction who don't want other people writing fan fiction on their stuff. So, so this is like a, a not everybody believes in the golden rules, but you need yeah. to ask. Or I mean, it's still considered polite to ask. So I'm, sure. if I'm going to remix your stuff, because 
my relationship with you as a like fellow fan writer is different from our relationship to J.K. Rowling. We can't ask her directly for permission. Like she's a big publishing person. But a lot of internet meme picks seem just have to basically take another's work and messing with it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a big thing with artists, too. Like, messing with their art, like, reposting without attribution. Like, people do care a lot about that. Are, are people conscious of, like, Creative Commons licensing issues, that sort of thing? Yeah, I would say so. Um, yeah, I mean, it's mostly, it's not really the legal, because it's all non commercial, so it's like, it's more the etiquette of it, but it's sure. sort of the good and bad etiquette to do things. Do people use the Creative Commons license in their stories? Like, it used to be like no derivatives? Yeah, or something? I've seen it a few times. Um, I remember we talked about having it like just a, like a blanket thing on the archive, and we decided not to do that. Um, but like, it is, license everybody's like sort of and make everybody who used it all agree to a certain. Or at license. least yeah, give people an option like a like a GitHub thing where you just like. Sure, like but. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's tricky because it is, you know, even though, like, it's, there's never been a ruling that any of this is illegal and it is pretty well protected under fair use law, there haven't been a lot of legal rulings on it, so it is still a little bit of a gray area that people are a little yeah. sensitive to about sort of claiming their rights to their work, but um, it's another big thing, like, that Amazon uh, has a new, like, fan fiction publishing thing. Um, and so they a lot of to do about the licenses that they have and the, the rights that they're asking for to work. A lot of, a lot of pushback on that. Well, thanks, Nancy, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you.